and today we will be discussing the second session of the Bhagavad Gita uh, key verses. So in the first verse, first session, I started with 1.1, where I focused primarily on the context of the Gita and how is it relevant today. It addresses the enduring questions of um, what is um, what is the right thing to do? What are what are we meant to do in life? And with that background, today we'll move to a, a fundamental teaching of the Gita. That will be the one of the key verses. This will be two point one three. I have prepared a list of around 51 topics that we will be discussing which we will share shortly after, after the class in the group. So each session will be based on one particular question whose answer we will be seeking. And I am also sharing, I am also doing a screen share over here and I will also be sending in a PowerPoint on the WhatsApp which you can use. So broadly, we will be discussing today on 2.13 in the Bhagavad Gita. That is, Dehi no sminyatha dehe kaumaram yavanam jara tatha dehaan tara praptir dheeras tatra So, this is, talks, this talks about identity. Dehi no sminyatha dehe. Krishna says, inside the body, in Dehi no, there is the embodied, there is the one to whom the body belongs. Kaumaram Yavanamjara and that embodied being goes through various bodily stages like childhood, youth and old age. Kaumaram Yavanamjara Tatha Dehantara Praptir and thereafter that is Dehantara. <coughs> One goes beyond this body to another body. Dhiras Tatra Namhiyati One is not bewildered the wise person who knows this is not bewildered by such a change. So broadly, I'll talk this in three terms. So I'm sharing my screen here. We have, I'll be discussing broadly three points here. The need for spirituality, the rationale for spirituality and the result of spirituality. So this verse <coughs> talks about, by spirituality I mean not just a vague sense of feeling good. What different people think about spirituality and what it is, this will be discussed more in a later session. But here the emphasis will be that there is a spiritual side to us, there is a non-material core, the soul. Which is, actual, the, which is the actual person, which is actually who we are. <coughs> so why does even one even need to explore whether there is there's some non-material side to it? And then if the Bhagavad Gita says there is, well, what is, uh, can we as rational, rational people uh, accept it? And if somebody accepts it, what is the result of it? How can we know whether it is true or not? So let's begin. Here we have, firstly, just as our body needs physical nutrition, we as we also need metaphysical orientation. By metaphysical orientation, essentially what I mean is, we all need a sense of place and purpose, which is, which is, intrinsically tied with our identity. So, for example, right now, say I am, I am situated at a particular place. That is say, I am seated in Mumbai and I have a particular purpose. So I identify myself. So, I am trying to share the Bhagavad Gita's wisdom. So, our identity basically is associated with a particular place and a particular purpose. Say, <clears throat> some of you may be software engineers, some of you may be in India, some of you may be in America, wherever, in different parts of the world. But basically, our identity orients us in life. That means, 
that who we are shapes what we are meant to do and we saw arjuna basically had a confusion based on inability to understand what is to be done and what is not to be done so his his complexity his perplexity was that what should i do so when i say place and purpose this can be at various levels of abstraction so somebody might say that okay what what are they might say what if you ask them if you want they want to orient themselves say it's like if you are in an ocean and we are navigating we need orientation okay this is the direction i am going so we all are at a particular place and are going for a particular purpose so an orientation might be that okay uh, i am i am a software engineer and i am driving to office that's one orientation but beyond that we could have another or another orientation which is that you know i am a young man or a young woman and i am trying to grow in my career another orientation could be that i am say an indian working for working to make a living in america working to build a, have greater prospects in america i am an american working to do certain things so we when we talk about our location we could say that i am a mother i am a husband i am a son or a daughter and then i am taking care of my family i am earning money to take care of my family whatever so we our sense of place and purpose they orient us and this orientation is extremely important just as say if one day we woke up and we just didn't know we found we are in a completely unfamiliar place and hey where am i and how do i get here what am i to do so even if we are at an unfamiliar place then at least oh i have to go back home i was supposed to go to work will i reach there in time so when somebody is kidnapped they are taken to an unfamiliar place but imagine if somebody is simultaneously kidnapped and say hit on the head because of which they get amnesia then they won't they don't know where they are they don't have a sense of place and they don't even have a sense of purpose hey what am i to do at least we could say somebody gets amnesia and knows they got amnesia they will have a sense of purpose that okay i want to find out who i am that is also a sense of purpose but you know if we don't have a sense of place and purpose then we can't orient ourselves in life life can become extremely disorienting when we join a company uh, or any any big institution often there are orientation courses so orientation courses basically are meant to introduce us to our place and purpose within the big picture so what the company is what the vision is all that is told but basically their idea is by that you understand where you are and what you can do or what you are meant to do how you can grow so we need a metaphysical orientation now why am i using the word metaphysical orientation because our sense of place and purpose can be increasingly abstract so if i say right now at a physical level somebody might say that okay i am i am a software engineer i am driving to my office so that's very physical but if somebody says that okay i am an indian uh, trying to make it trying to live the american dream now indian itself is a abstraction there is its abstraction means the concept of a nation is there are geographical boundaries to a territory but the concept of identifying with a nation is a conceptual construct and similarly making for living the american dream that's a concept so uh, we have various orienters in our life say suppose somebody lives in ireland and that's where their family is their social circle is their whole life is over there in that island and they fly out for some business work and when they are gone say tsunami comes and the whole island is reduced to water and then suddenly they will have no place and purpose their life their not only their home is gone but their whole purpose of life was associated with their family with their friends with the social circle it's all gone 
so we can't even imagine what kind of disorienti distress and devastation disorientation can cause often if there is physical devastation then that causes problems but if there is disorientation it's who oh, suppose somebody has grown up to be an athlete and they get a injury which makes athletics impossible for them then it's not so much the pain of the injury it is the disorientation that is caused that is a big problem what am i to do they always identify themselves as athletes and now who are they so this often is a problem for for say athletes who become celebrities and then they retire unless they can reorient themselves maybe become a sports commentator or a sports coach or something like that then it is a it is a very scary thing to live thinking that the best part of my life is behind me and now what i can do is basically a shadow role or something like that of what i was so unless they reorient themselves they can become emotional wrecks so sometimes we don't realize uh, the whole point is we all need metaphysical orientation but we don't realize how important it is it's only when we are disoriented that's the time the question comes up so the bhagavad gita begins with arjuna completely disoriented and it is our spirituality which gives us a lasting orientation it gives us an orientation that won't be stolen from us Uh, we might be a software as i said somebody might be an athlete but uh, that orientation can be lost if they get an injury that orientation can be lost by so many other catastrophes they might be dropped from the team and they might be banned from the sport they might I mean, the sport itself might become unpopular and really become economically unviable so whatever we all have certain orienters in our life and these orienters can be taken away from us at any moment and in the case of arjuna the orienters were not so, so much taken away as two orienters pointed him in two different directions his kula dharma pointed him in one direction his kshatriya dharma in another direction so when this happened when the orienters were pointing him in opposite directions he just didn't know what to do and when he didn't know what to do that is the time when the bhagavad gita provided him metaphysical orientation so this is a verse that is orienting arjuna again and it is our sense of identity gives us a sense of place and purpose so what is the place krishna is saying arjuna you are a soul inside a body and the purpose will be mentioned in the next verses purpose is ultimately spiritual evolution is spiritual spiritual growth it's ultimately liberation so there is place and purpose and this place and purpose can never be lost because we as souls are always going to be souls we might tomorrow not be having our same professional designations we might not have a national designations we might not have a family designations there are there are various identities we have so we have functional identities so our family our nationality in today's age of even gender transplant surgery say surgeries and things like that happening on gender a may not be a permanent identity but there are these functional identities we have and below all these we have a fundamental identity and that fundamental identity is that we are souls and we the soul is on a journey the uh, details of the journey will come later in the bhagavad gita but the soul is a journey of evolution of spiritual evolution so this is the first point so krishna speaks this philosophical concept of the soul primarily to serve arjuna's need of disorientation to reorient him krishna reminds him of his fundamental identity and the idea with this is that without or being oriented properly we won't be able to function at all so arjuna is not able to function the start of this was to describe how arjuna has become paralyzed he just puts aside his bow say i can't fight he says i'm undecided 
न चैतमह कतरो गरीयो यद्वा जयेम यदिवानो जयेयु यान हत्वा न जीविषाम से वसत प्रभु के धारत राष्ट्र so i don't know whether i should fight i don't know whether uh, fighting winning is better or losing the, letting my letting my relatives live is better i'm confused and that's how krishna gives this reorientation so the, this is the first point so as i said the power point will be discussing three points so the second point is the uh, need for uh, is the rational for spirituality so in rational i will talk about three things we talk about some evidences based on consciousness past life memories and near death experiences so this is what we are going to discuss as far as the need for spirituality is concerned so there are near death the scientific pointers to this are primarily the form near death experiences past life memories and there are the characteristics of the soul so let's look at it simply simply first from the point of view of inference to think of ourselves as our bodies is is obvious because we identify ourselves with our bodies that's what we physically see that's what Uh, when the body has pain when the body is injured we feel pain so to identify ourselves as physical creatures is is an obvious identification but there are certain characteristics that we exhibit that cannot be explained if we are simply biological machines or biological robots if we are just our bodies so what are these characteristics these three are the defining characteristics of the soul that is sat chit ananda is that sat chit ananda is sat is eternity existence but enduring existence chit is consciousness which leads to the faculty of knowledge and ananda is joyfulness which makes us also seek joy so basically these three things sat that these these three you could say these three things they characterize our our overall behavior so we are we we'll, we want to live forever we want to know more and more and we ultimately seek joy if we consider these characteristics as compared to what from a biological perspective is the function or are the functions of our body from a, if we consider from a physical evolutionary perspective darwin talked about survival of the fittest so basically we human beings live primarily our first basically we are survival and reproduction machines that's the idea which biology gives us now survival basically and reproduction these two involve from the uh, dharmic perspective we call these as eating sleeping mating and defending so eating sleeping and defending these are all for survival and mating is for reproduction so basically we live uh we we'll, we at a biological level if we are simply biological creatures then these would be our driving influences and yet we live for more than this we don't just live for these things certainly we live live we want food we want um, we need, need to rest ourselves uh we look for partners and there is a danger we defend ourselves but while these are drives which are defined by our body these are not the drives that define our entire being so let's consider sat now survival is something is we all want to survive but sat refers to enduring existence now why is it that we want to live forever nothing in nature survives forever and our longing to live forever if we look at it around in nature if we were simply 
biological creatures programmed by our environment to respond and adapt to stimuli then nothing in an environment in a lives forever even the huge mountains the rockies the uh, the himalayas nothing is eternal the twin towers when it collapsed it 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 because it is a magnificent edifice it had that illusion of permanence and when it collapsed it caused a permanent psyche a permanent scar on the western psyche uh, it burst the bubble of comfort and security that had been built but the point is that even that is not eternal so if nothing around us lasts forever where does our longing to live forever come from it doesn't come from anything physical might it be coming from something non physical might it come from the spiritual core of who we are so it's this longing is as unusual as say a child in a remote african tribe completely unconnected with the world the child was suddenly one day says to his mom mom i want a pizza and the mother asks where did you hear about pizza from so if there's nothing in the if nothing in the surroundings of the child tells us about a pizza then naturally the question will come up where did you hear about a pizza from so that's the question of uh, sat so we seek enduring existence could this point to our eternality now chit is consciousness now we to be conscious is to be curious to be conscious is to be desirous we want to know about things now desires can mean many things but again if we consider humanity's search for knowledge even scientific knowledge you know we want to know many things just for the sake of knowing them it is not just for the sake of uh, if because that knowledge will be useful for us when newton saw the apple falling and when you were sitting under a apple tree as the story goes then you either the apple fell in front of him or the apple fell on him and he could just have picked up the apple and ate and gone away and that would have been a the biologically expected thing to do we we need food food has come on its own to us let's eat it but it was his curiosity okay what made this apple fall that started the engine that is modern science that led to the development of gravity well it's his it's his impressive intelligence that he came up with the gravity from such a simple observation but simultaneously it's it points to the reality that we humans are curious and we are curious for things more than simply survival uh, what are needed for our survival for our 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 reproduction so why do we have this curiosity at all and especially we humans come up with art music literature philosophy and why do we seek this it's if you consider many of the abstract abstract subjects that we study it's only later that their concrete use comes up but we get a joy in that animals don't <clears throat> seek metaphysical uh, knowledge we just exist so this curiosity is something is quite distinctive and then there is joy we all seek joy and in fact we could say at one level pleasure is the purpose of our life but at another level we could ask that actually if we were simply creatures designed for survival then the search for pleasure is often the greatest threat to survival say a fish is <coughs> caught by a bait a uh, mouse uh, is caught by some cheese in a cage and both of them go there because they think hey this is, this is enjoyable so and often uh, we get caught for <coughs> now we could at least say that the animals have excuses that their whatever traps tempts and traps them it looks like food for them but we humans don't even have that excuse 
It's a cigarette. Doesn't look like food to anyone. Drugs or alcohol doesn't look like food to anyone. And yet we get attracted to it. And then we get trapped. So in many ways we could say, that in some areas, <clears throat> when we look for food, that's fine. But in many areas, the search for pleasure is often the cause of the greatest trouble. It gets, it gets us into trouble. And <clears throat> why do we so desperately long for joy even at the cost of risking our own life for the sake of that joy? If, <clears throat> as now there is the fantasy of making robots which could, be, which could simulate the actions that humans do, uh, science fiction might talk about robots being conscious, but uh, it's first of all very difficult to do that. And where consciousness comes from is itself an unanswered question. And so that's why how to generate it is also very difficult to do. But you know, emotions, especially the search for pleasure, is what uh, comes in our way. And this is called in, phys in philosophy and in uh, science as the hard problem of consciousness. That, you, that we could do everything that we did without any emotions. And in many cases, we might be able to do it better. Because emotions, we want pleasant emotions, but often we get unpleasant emotions. So emotions come sometimes, sometimes obstruct our perception. Emotions sometimes get in our way of doing things properly. So, we could very well do without emotions. So, why do we at all have emotions? Where do they come from? Now, brain science, all that we have found is that they correlate. But there is no one point where the, or, or consciousness originates in the brain. There is no one part. We experience consciousness as an integrated experience. So if a bird flies in front of us, there are different parts of the brain which see the color of the bird, another which see the shape of the bird, another which hear the sound of the bird, another which sees the motion of the bird. But we get it all as an integrated experience. So it's not like out of sync video where you see the motion first and hear the sound later. No, it comes as synchronized. So <clears throat> if it was simply the brain that we're experiencing, then there is no one part of the brain which is connected to all other parts of the brain which would integrate all that the brain is processing and give us an integrated experience. So basically, our sense of selfhood, it's, it's one unite, unitary locale, 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 of consci locale of consciousness. We identify ourselves as one consciousness who is perceiving things as an integrated experience. So biologically, this is almost impossible to explain. So this very existence of consciousness with its characteristics of enduring existence, of, uh, of, a, of curiosity and of pleasure seeking. These point to something non-physical within us. And this is itself, of course, intuitive. So there are a couple of other things we'll discuss about the rationale for spirituality that... That there are scientific pointers, primary among them are near-death experiences and past life memories. In near-death experiences, there are cases of people, I have written a book on demystifying reincarnation and I have given many cases in that. So there are cases where people have actually lost consciousness, especially say somebody has, there's a <clears throat> case where a patient had a brain aneurysm. And they had to do a, a operation called Operation Standstill, where basically the person was given an artificial heart attack and then all the blood was drained from their body. The brain was made completely, brain waves became completely flat. And then the brain is taken out from the cranial cavity. And then the doctor reaches below to the aneurysm and removes the aneurysm. Now, at that time, there are loud sound beats like a tea kettle or a train whistle at a much higher frequency going on in the ears because even the slightest presence of consciousness at that time can cause the patient, uh, can cause havoc 
the patient if the patient feels any pain and reacts and shakes or whatever so the patient has to be absolutely unconscious and all by all known parameters the patient is unconscious and still <clears throat> the spangler would go oh, oh, pioneered this surgery called Operation Standstill that the body is brought to a standstill. He reports of cases where patients have remembered and seen hey what happened? Uh, they remember so this lady who had this aneurysm the first she saw herself from a perspective above her body so she saw herself lying on the operation theatre and she saw herself from above and she's first thing she noticed is hey, What's, ha what's happened with my hair? Why is it cut like this? And then she noticed that it was supposed to be brain surgery, but somebody was doing something with her thigh area. So they were basically preparing for the bi for the bypass for the for inducing a heart attack to get the heart to stop functioning. And uh, she remembered the conversation between the patients, between the medical staff. And biologically, it is impossible. And near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences are not as uncommon as some people might think. They are quite well documented. And basically they raise the question, how can we be conscious when we are not conscious? How can we be conscious when we are not conscious means when our brain is unconscious? So the most reasonable explanation for this is that the body is here, the 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 source of consciousness which the Bhagavad Gita says in the soul is here and normally the soul functions its consciousness is rooted through the body but during certain traumatic events or during some disorienting events the soul and the body may temporarily separate and whereas some people presume that the brain is a generator of consciousness but the brain could well be the transmitter of consciousness and not only a transmitter of consciousness the brain could even be the reducer of consciousness reducer means that the soul itself has pure broad consciousness but if the soul's consciousness comes through the body then you can see only what is seen through the body you cannot perceive any other things so basically it becomes like Somebody is in a, is, is say in a dungeon with only some windows. That person can perceive a lot, but they can perceive only through what, is, what the windows are showing. So for the soul, the various senses are like windows. And there are cases of, there's a whole book called Mind Sight, where there are, are people with out of body and near death experiences. And there are, there's a whole book about people who were blind. So normally they couldn't see anything, they couldn't see even see themselves. The only time they could see was when they had out-of-body experiences, near-death and out-of-body. So near-death experiences, basically when somebody is near death and they have certain experiences, out-of-body is when within the near-death experiences, they see themselves from a perspective outside the body. So that is the only time they could see. So the most again, the most reasonable explanation is that the when the soul's consciousness gets rooted through the body, then if the body as a biological machine is damaged in some way, then the person can't have consciousness. But the person can't say if the eye optic nerve is damaged or the eye is damaged, the person can't see. But if the soul comes out of the body, then that particular damage of the sensory pathway um, doesn't impede the soul anywhere anymore and the person can see. So out of body experience is one evidence. Then there is near the, um, there is also past life memories, and this is a fascinating field. Where children of three, four, five suddenly say to their parents, "Mom, where is my other mom?" And the parents are taken aback. But the child says, "The child starts giving specific details. I stay here. I do this. I go there, and I want to go and meet my family over there." And it's not just recollections. There are, there is a four level thing. There are recollections, then there are recognitions. When the child goes, is taken to that place, they recognize the people over there from the previous family, they recognize the, the places, the objects. And it's not only recollections, recognitions, but beyond that, there is also 
behaviors. The child doesn't behave like a child from this family. Child behaves as if they belong to that family. And then there is also birthmarks and birth defects. And uh, birthmarks and birth defects means that say the child had a, uh, some fatal injury in the previous life and they get a birthmark corresponding to that injury. So I have described in my book the case of Nesep Unlutatskiran who was in Turkey and as a, as a small boy he started telling that I live in another place called Mersin and I have a family over there. So Nesep, uh, he as a small child would he would uh, basically start saying that I want to go over there and when he went over there at that time he, he he said that he initially his parents were confused because he said that I'm Nesip but his name he said but I'm Nesip Budak and they said no you're Nesip so then there was a confusion his name in his previous life was the same Nesip is a common name in Turkey but when he went there what happened was he had never been to that town but he went straight he took his parents he took his relatives who had taken him there straight to that, a particular house and there in that house he basically talked with them and uh, he recognized there was a widow who was staying there and as soon as he saw this widow uh, she said that she had been she, she had been married to a man named Nesip Budak and she he not only recognized her he recognized the picture of his children but he also told things which nobody could have known. So this Nesip in his previous life was a violent person who also would take alcohol. So once he, in under the spell of alcohol and anger, he had attacked his wife and uh, she had dodged the blow, but the knife had uh, had grazed against her her inner thigh and she had a scar over there. So then one of the, Antonia Mills was the researcher who did all this research. So Dr. Jan Stevenson was also a prominent past life researcher. So these past life researchers, so one of the ladies, she had this woman examined. They found that they, she had a scar exactly where Nisap had said and Nisip had said. And it was, she said, yes, my, my ex-husband had attacked me. That's how I got this. Now, how could a small six-year-old child living in a city somewhere else, who has never met a woman, know something about a uh, scar on a private part of a woman's body. So it's, a, it's there is, there's very, there's practically no logical explanation if we consider from a material perspective. And not only that, it is not only just recognitions, but also behaviors. His, uh, now, his widow, she had remarried and when Nasib saw uh, her photo with another man he he was a small six year old boy got so angry he said that no, you are my wife you are not anyone else's wife and he wanted to take the picture and tear it apart and now his kids from the previous life were older than him almost and yet he was fondling their hair and smelling their hair and treating them like a father would treat the children so the behavior was remarkable and most significantly Nasib had multiple birthmarks and whenever he would talk about his past life, he would point to the birthmarks on various parts of his body and he would say, this was where I was stabbed. And that was what precisely had happened to Nesip previously. That Nesip had, he had got into a drunken fight with someone and the other person had taken out a knife and stabbed him at multiple places. And uh, because it had been a murder case, so there was a police report, post-mortem had been done and the past life researchers got access to the post-mortem report and they they found that Nesip had six birthmarks which corresponded with the fatal wounds from his previous life. So now, uh, how precise was the correlation of the location? Say if you say somebody has a wound on the arm, say up, upper arm. Now upper arm, you can have so many places on the upper arm. So, doctor, uh, so the past life researchers divided the human body into a grid of one in one twenty eight, say x y coordinates. So this is say this is one coordinate, say maybe two on top and maybe 
10 on the uh, right if you consider the full body's expanse like that and they divided the whole body into 128 coordinate system and they located and they found that this precise correlation for six birthmarks so the probability of that working out by chance is 1 by 128 raised to the power of 6 is extremely low probability so past life memory is also point very strongly to the idea that if we consider the previous life to be one circle the this is one circle the new life is another circle then what is the intersection point between the two the only reasonable intersection point is at a physical level that body has died and this body is available some is alive somewhere else so what is the what is the correlation the only correlation would be a soul who is something non material which has inhabited this body and gone to that body so what krishna says uh, in the bhagavad gita that the soul changes bodies that's what is demonstrated in past life memories now if we consider, so this is the rationale for spirituality. Each of these, there are many more cases available. And there's much more reasoning that could be done for it. But for our purposes, this will suffice. And now we'll go to the last part. And then we can have some questions. Just briefly. So what, is, what are the result of spirituality? So if you had to consider, okay, if the spiritual stuff is real, then what will happen? Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that... We will become calm. We will not be disturbed by life's ups and downs. Tam stitikshya swabharata. So result of that identity will be tolerance. Will be calmness. How will that result? So generally as I said, we all need certain orienters in life. So, <clears throat> if say, we are talking with someone and that person just yells or behaves in a strange way. Then what happened? We'll be a little taken aback. But if we know that in advance that say that if we if it's just an ordinary conversation between two people, we'll be taken aback. But say if we are a mental health care provider and we are talking with people who are mental health care inmates, then we know that the mentally disturbed people and we expect the unexpected over there. So basically whenever we are oriented properly then we it, it moderates our expectation so if we know this road has very high traffic then we can go we will, we will not get so disturbed if we are not able to move faster so like that what spirituality does is that it gives us a sense of orientation that doesn't depend on our external material things so if I think I, I am the body and bodily pleasure is my is the goal of my life, then anything that interferes with my bodily pleasure, that will seem extremely disorienting. But if I have a higher purpose, then disorientation of bodily pleasure won't trouble me that much. This, uh, so this uh, disrupt, interruption in bodily pleasure rather. So Krishna says, if we nourish ourselves spiritually, if we are oriented spiritually properly, we will become calmer. We will not be disturbed by life's ups and downs, such as pleasure or pain, such as heat or cold. When we learn to tolerate them. And then, this 2.14 talks about tolerance, 2.15 talks about transcendence. That we will eventually transcend life's ups and downs. And we will attain life eternal. We will attain liberation. So what liberation is? That we will, that will be discussed in the Bhagavad Gita in a later session. But I'll summarize what I spoke today. Today we discussed about 2.13 in the Bhagavad Gita. And the question was, you know, who are we really? So I talked about this question, who am I, is our orienter in life's complexity. And our sense of identity gives us a sense of place and purpose. So, and we have this orientation of place and purpose at various levels of abstraction. It could be a particular physical location where we are going for that physical location or another location. It could be we are in a country, at, we are in a company at a particular hierarchy, we are in a particular family at a particular level. So, if we are disoriented, then we can't function. 
So just as the body needs physical nutrition, our core, our we also need physical metaphysical orientation in our life. And then I talk about how Arjuna disoriented and Krishna told him that you are a spiritual being and you are on a journey of spiritual evolution. That was the orientation that will not be disturbed by anything, any of the ups and downs of life. And then I talked about what is the rationale for spirituality. At a bodily level, we will have the drives of, of for, for reproduction, for survival, which involves food, rest and uh, <clears throat> self-defense. But we, human beings, especially, we long for enduring existence. We long for knowledge. We have innate curiosity. And we long for pleasure. And in some cases, these three longings go along with the bodily drives. But sometimes they diverge. And when they diverge, then the question arises, why are these present at all? Now that is explainable best by considering that we are that there is a non-material core to us. And that's why we have these longings. And then I talked about cases of past life memories as well as near-death experiences. With respect to consciousness also, I talked about how consciousness is a mystery, that we have the binding problem, that we experience, con experience consciousness as one integrated experience, not inputs coming from the eyes and the ears to discrete parts of the brain, but we, we have integrated experience. So where is the integrator in the brain? That's not actually in the brain. It is using the brain to get the information. And the integration is happening at a non-material level and the soul experiences it. Beyond this, I talked about the result of spiritual practices that we will grow spiritually and then we will not be so disturbed by the things that disorient us in daily life. So thank you very much. I have some questions which I'll take. So even after practicing spiritual life, why are we still confused? <clears throat> so basically, life is confusing. It's not so much of one or zero. It's a, it's like a gradual progression. Instead of thinking of spiritual advancement as uh, digital, we need to see it as analog, as incremental. So suppose there's a firefighter who has a knowledge of how to put out fires. But, say, even after all the theoretical training, the first time a firefighter sees fire, they, they may panic. And instead of fighting the fire, they just drop the fire hose and uh, or get petrified. But if a firefighter is more trained, the more trained, the more experienced, then what happens? Even when that, that particular issue comes up, so they see a big fire, even an experienced firefighter might panic for a few moments, but then they come back on the right track fast. Okay, it's a big fire, but let's, do this. let's attack it from here. Let's do this. Let's do this. So training basically means that the intelligence becomes faster than the mind. That our instincts become, our trained instincts come upon us faster. And that's how we move forward in our life. So each of us needs this tra training and that's why we need to be patient with ourselves. That yes, rather than thinking that I'm committing the mistakes, as soon as we realize, okay, I'm going on the wrong track, then come on the right track. So as soon as we realize I'm panicking, like a firefighter realizes, okay, no need to panic. Let me do this. I know what to do in this case. Just start doing the right thing and gradually uh, it will increase. So we need knowledge as a map, but then after we have the map, we also need to learn to drive. So the two are having a map and learning to drive are two different things. So jnana is getting the map. Buddhi is learning to drive. So buddhi takes time and we need to keep driving. And in, in one sense, driving is basically the car, the vehicle will tend to go off track and we keep, tend to keep getting it back on track. And Krishna said, this is the way it is expected to be. The mind wanders, refocus. The mind wanders, refocus. The essence of commitment is recommitment. That it's not that once we commit and that's how we will be for the rest of our lives. We'll go off track, we recommit. We go off track, we recommit. That's how we all grow. So, that's one question. Now, knowing that 
<clears throat> so how do we realize that we are souls? It happens gradually when sometimes at a physical level there could be extreme pain but we absorb ourselves in the holy name, in spiritual sound vibration and say, we realize, okay, this is, you know, I'm experiencing, if I were the body, I should be experiencing pain. But I'm experiencing something different. Uh, but I'm not experiencing pain. I'm still having some relief. I'm still having some peace. Where is that coming from? So when we have certain bodily experiences, but our experiences are different from the body's experiences. That is a, that is a good example of times when we can realize our, that our identity ex expands beyond the body. Say, it could also be that the body, at a bodily level, we are enjoying some immense pleasure. But we still, I'm not happy. We might be eating something, it's delicious, we long for it. But when we eat it, hey, this is not all great as it, touts out, as it is touted to be. What's going on? So we can look at times when we have experiences that, that are not explainable only in terms of physical terms. And they point to the, uh, point to the reality of the soul. And over a period of time, right now we are sleeping. And that's why we can't perceive directly. But just like say a baby is sleeping and the baby can't perceive her mother. But you say the baby is cold and the mother puts a comforter on the baby. Now the baby's eyes are closed, but when the baby feels the comforter, the baby infers from that feeling. Oh, my mother is here. My mother has put this comforter on me. And that's how the baby understands. So similarly, when we expose ourselves to spiritual stimuli, when we say go to a temple, when we chant the holy names, when we recite verses, and we experience some non-material relief, some non-material joy. So we infer from that, hey, this is although I can't see this whole spiritual business because I'm asleep, but I can experience this. Prateksha Vagamam Dharmam, Krishna says. That it is directly experienced by practice of devotional service. Now, the next question is, why can't we remember our past lives? Multiple reasons. <clears throat> First is that each life is a journey, is a new phase in a journey. And the normal system is, if you consider, see how our memory functions. Most of our memory is situational. See, right now I'm talking with you. So the things I remember are primarily associated with what I need for talking with you. If we started remembering everything which we know at any particular moment, we would be overwhelmed. So we could, if we started remembering all of our past, then we would not be able to function. We would live in a perpetual flashback mode. And say even we might have lived for some time in our childhood in a particular place. But we may remember it very vaguely. Because, but if we go to that place, we may remember it more. So our, much of our memory is situational. And uh, so when the soul, go, when we are out of that situation, we don't remember it that much. So when the soul leaves one body and goes to another body, because most of the memory of the soul is situational, that memory is lost. And that's, an, uh, that's a normal way we function. But uh, then the more rather than asking why we can't remember, we understand that Memory is situational and forgetting is natural. It's not only natural, it's essential. Otherwise, we would have so much cognitive overload that we wouldn't be able to function. Huh. <clears throat> so, why do some people remember? That would be a more appropriate question to ask. And usually the reason is, uh, most people who remember is they have had some kind of abrupt or especially agonizing death. It's, see, for the soul, when the soul leaves the body, the soul needs some time to process. But if the soul can't process it, just like say if you're in America and you come to India, then there is a jet lag. The body's biological clock is in India, but the body is in America, but the physical location is in India. The body still keeps functioning according to the uh, previous time zone. So similarly, we could say for some people, there's a transmigration lag. And this usually happens if somebody dies by being murdered. Uh, there's a sudden death and then the soul is not able to process the event of death. 
and because of that the soul has gone from this body to next body but psychologically or in terms of emotions the consciousness is lagging it is in the previous body and most of these most of these children when they go to their previous they go to the people from their previous life they meet them talk with them and then after that they get a sense of closure and then they may still stay connected with the family from the previous life but that emotional intensity that is there in the memory that is no longer there so basically death is meant to be a closure but if there is no no closure at that time then some people as an exception remember their past lives and especially going to this point that if the physical birthmarks are there how do the birthmarks come about that's also related to that sometimes the sudden sense oh i was shot i was stabbed that creates such a mark on the on the psyche of a person that they keep thinking about it, keep thinking about it and the soul goes into new body also the soul thinks about it and that's how that mark gets imprinted on from the it's basically a psychosomatic mark from the mind it comes to the body so the physical wound gets impressed on the psyche on the mind and then that mind along with the soul goes to the next body and the mind because of thinking with shock horror compulsiveness a perverse compulsiveness then that gets imprinted on the body now so if human life is so rare oh okay, i'll just have one or two questions and the remaining we can answer pri privately if human life is so rare why, why is it still so difficult to find the purpose of life yeah that's because in today's world especially we have gone far far away from orienting ourselves properly we have got lots of distractions the material world is a place of forgetfulness and much of technological advancement is where we can have more and more avenues for forgetting life's ultimate purpose so naturally the purpose of life becomes difficult but if somebody seeks it genuinely that if i i really want to know what life is meant for if we maintain that question eventually we will be guided it may take time for us to get the answers it may take time for us to accept the answers but if we keep searching surely the answers will come upon us it's just we need patience yeah i mentioned about the fatal marks how do they come on last body if krishna wants us to take up a new body and live a new life why do some people why do people have passed up life recollection i mentioned that it's because of the closure has not happened okay so one last question and then <clears throat> okay what are what happened uh, the soul going to another body at death well 213 doesn't say this 222 later says this, that it gives the example of how we give up clothes and take up new clothes when the first clothes become old like that we give up the body and take up the new body now where does the soul go as per karma and what is the concept of ghost ghost i'll explain a little later in detail i have a powerpoint on ghosts also but basically the soul does some karma in this life and the soul can have can go through different levels the soul can go to lower levels of existence which is what we would call as heaven or hell it can go to lower species the soul can also go to animal species and live over there or the soul can come back in the earth itself at a human level and endure some karma so depending on the body is basically like a dress for the soul and depending on the kind of karma that the soul has done the karma we could say like the budget how much money the soul has earned so when we when one dress gets torn for us we buy a new dress what determines the new dress that we'll buy it depends on basically what we like and how much we can pay for so similarly the soul gets a new body based on its karma whether it will be a human body a non human body or a non earthly body at another level of existence now ghosts are extreme cases where the soul loses one body but doesn't have the karma to get a next body so then the ghosts are basically disembodied beings we'll talk about ghosts more in a few future session so remaining questions i will answer on the whatsapp i will answer and you'll get the links in the whatsapp group thank you very much for your attention and participation hare krishna